Um, so hi, hi everyone, I'm Conrad, I'm from Einstein and I'm going to talk about kind of one level up from kind of the infrastructure side from the bundlers and, and the paymasters. So I'm going to talk about smart accounts, specifically modularizing smart accounts and kind of like the future of um, smart account interoperability. Um, so just as a quick kind of like starter so I can kind of see if I can skip the, the start. Um, who here has heard about modular smart accounts? And who here has heard about ERC-7579? Okay, cool. Um, so there's a few um, people that haven't, so I'll go over kind of quite briefly uh, the start. So obviously we have kind of account abstraction and smart accounts, and they su deliver superior user experience. Um, but some problems that exist are kind of lack of customization. So users don't really have a lot of choice of the features that they get. It's kind of, you get an implementation and that has the features that you get. Um, there's also significant like vendor lock-in and also fragmentation in the ecosystem. And then finally, one problem is that there's a lot of duplication of work. So say that I have an idea for a new feature that I want to include in a smart account, I actually have to go build my own smart account, or I fork some existing one, kind of add the features that I want, and I have to get it re-audited, kind of like distributed through like SDKs and so on. <clears throat> so yeah, that leads to a lot of duplication of engineering work. Um, and modular smart accounts, to be clear, they're not a new concept, but kind of they're starting to take off now. Kind of SAFE has been doing modular smart accounts for a long time. And kind of the most popular smart accounts, um, especially for 37 accounts like Economy and ZeroDev, have been modular for um, around a year now. Um, but very roughly, kind of what the idea there is, instead of building a monolithic account that, can, like I said, has all the features in it, um, you essentially modularize the account so that you have the account itself, which is pretty minimal, has like the features that you need for it to, to function, so like validation and execution. And then all the interesting feature components are actually moved outside of the account into what we call modules. So you can think of those modules kind of like Legos that you can stack on top of each other and kind of like use together with each other. Um, so either a developer or a user could say, I want this feature in my account, I want that feature in my account, kind of add them. And at a later stage, they can just remove them or swap them out. <clears throat> and kind of the next step there is what are these modules? Um, so roughly kind of right now we think of four types of modules and there might be like more in the future, but the four types that we currently like think about are validators, executors, hooks, and fallbacks. Um, so validators, as kind of the name suggests, do validation logic. So you have an account that kind of is called from for example a 437, 437 entry point and the account needs to determine, do I validate, uh, do I execute this, this user operation or this transaction? So it does some validation. And what these validators do is kind of the account will call out into this validator module and ask it, please do this validation. So for example, you can have a pass keys based validator that will take the input, take the signature that's generated from, um, from your device and then kind of validate that and return, yes, please execute this, this user operation or this transaction, or no, um, we don't want to execute that. Then the second module type is what we call executors. So those kind of modify the execution behavior of accounts. So one kind of easy example you can think of is automations. Um, so you can have an account that does kind of like automation or where you want to do automations on. So for example, you could do a swap, then you wait for the return value of that swap, and then you do something else based on that. Then the third module type um, are what we call hooks, and those basically are triggered before and after execution. So what you can do in these hooks is you can enforce certain conditions. One example there is spending limits. So you could say, I want kind of my account, or maybe even kind of like this specific key on my account, to only be able to transact or spend 200 USDC per day. So the hook can kind of, before the execution, it can check, is the spending limit reached already? In this case, just deny it. If it's not, kind of the execution will happen. And then after the execution, the hook can check, either update the execution um, kind of with the new spending like value, or just reject, reject the transaction if it's spent more than kind of like the limit. And some other examples there are on security. So you can enforce permissions um, and kind of like other stuff in these hooks. And the final thing is just kind of what we call fallback handlers. And those are mostly around kind of future-proofing the account. Um, so one example there is on the safe. Um, it doesn't have native 437 support, but you can add a fallback handler into the safe, which makes it compatible with 437. Um, so that's an example of kind of future-proofing the account. <clears throat> 
and much of their accounts are kind of starting to take off, um, but the infrastructure is still lacking, and kind of importantly for today's talk, interoperability is not a given. So, so far we've seen different modular accounts that have different architectures, different interfaces, and most importantly, that use modules in different ways. So what does that mean for module developers? Is currently you need to build the same module multiple times for every modular account. So you might build one for the safe, one for the economy account, one for the kernel, and so on. <clears throat> so that kind of is, is the first step I was just talking about here, kind of the need for interoperability for modules. I think that's the most important piece um, that kind of a standard in this direction should aim to solve. And then the other two kind of like, like needs for standardization there are interoperability for smart accounts across different SDKs or applications. Um, so that makes it easy for kind of application builders to say, I want to support all the smart accounts instead of having to build custom adapters for, for each of them. And finally, having feature parity, meaning kind of you can use the same modules across the same accounts, also prevents vendor lock-in in that the user can, that has created an account on one, kind of from one account vendor, can actually then just go to another vendor and use the same setup. They can use the same modules and kind of have feature parity. <clears throat> so kind of late last year, we've, we were working quite a lot with teams like Economy and ZeroDev, and kind of especially around the int module interoperability piece. So what's been going on a lot over the last year is that all of these teams have built essentially the same modules, just for different account implementations. And so there's just a lot of duplicate kind of engineering work going on. And then there's been external builders, like third-party developers, that have also built kind of modules on top. And they, most of, most of the time, they had to choose between different accounts, or they had to actually just build the module, like the same module over and over again. So we started talking kind of with these vendors. And the screenshot in the bottom left here, you can see is from um, our developer tool around modules, which is called the module kit. And we actually had to build adapters for different modular accounts, such as economy, kernel, and safe. And it was all right in the module kit because we abstracted the kind of complexities away from the end user, but it was still kind of clunky. So a lot of the time, you also had to have on-chain adapters, which just increased gas costs and also introduced like security kind of like dependencies. So we started kind of compiling a document around mostly the learnings from different accounts, what different account implementation had done well, and what different account implementations hadn't done well, and also kind of where standardization is actually required. And as you can see here, that was quite extensive. It was like a 37-page doc. And that's how it started. And then kind of towards the end of last year, in December, we um, announced UC7579 <coughs> together with co-authors from ZeroDev, Biconomy, and OKX. Um, so yeah, introducing kind of 7579, it has four kind of key domains. So I'll go uh, through each of these in turn, but roughly there are execution, account config, module config, and modules themselves. Um, so the first of all is execution behavior. Why is this important? The exact behavior of the, of the account kind of when it comes to execution isn't actually that important for a standard. Um, kind of going back to the goals, the most important is that modules work across accounts. However, um, there's been a rise in a certain in one validator type, which is session keys, which a lot of people have started using. And session keys, kind of what they are, is they're scoped permissions or scoped keys that a user can give to a DAP um, or kind of, yeah to like an application, and then that application can execute certain kind of like um, certain transactions without needing additional confirmation for the user. So kind of like you can think about them as you go to a DAP. First time you kind of like you connect your account, you say I grant these session keys with these permissions, and then after that you don't have to sign anymore. For example, in a game you can just play the game; you don't have a pop up every two seconds. The problem there is that these session keys want to know what execution is actually being triggered on the account. They want to know is this execution draining all my funds? Is it spending ERC twenty tokens, or is it just interacting with a certain contract? And in order for session keys to do that, it actually has to be able to decode the execution kind of like the execution call data on the account. So that's kind of the first step. There, 7579 is super flexible. Um, so it supports all kinds of executions. And we've tried to kind of like be as flexible as possible. And different accounts might be more restrictive. So for example, a certain account might not implement delegate call-based executions, but the standard is as flexible as possible to allow kind of accounts to choose what they want to do. 
And then the second point is account configuration. Um, so those are mostly kind of like metadata and, and kind of like not super important um, kind of things, so I'll skip them. You can obviously find them in the standard. But kind of more importantly, the next point is module configuration. So how are modules actually installed and uninstalled on the account? And once again, this is also important for session keys because say you install a session key on your account and then that DAP just decides, oh, let me install some more modules so I can take over the account. Obviously that's not great. So the session key also needs to kind of like be able to see kind of what is happening. And then additionally, kind of to my other point earlier, like SDKs, um, such as like permissionless JS, want to be able to easily kind of install modules on your account and not kind of have to have different adapters for all these interfaces. And then the final point is actually modules themselves. Um, so earlier I was talking about the different module types. Um, so these are actually part of the standard. Um, and that means that it's actually very easy for accounts to determine kind of what, module, uh, what type a certain module is and then install it in the correct way. The problem with kind of like leaving this open-ended is that they actually be become not, on, not only incompatibilities, but also security kind of attack vectors if you don't distinguish between different module types. For example, um, imagine that you're installing a validator and it all seems like very nice, now I can do passkeys authentication, but then that validator certain, um, uh, suddenly can also call into the account and drain all my funds. Obviously not great, so an account needs to be able to distinguish is this a validator, is it installed as an executor, and so on. And obviously, importantly, we also need to standardize the interfaces so that every account can use those modules in the same way. <clears throat> so yeah, this is kind of a bit of high level, but kind of as we see this, or kind of why we think this is important, is that smart accounts, together with modules, will become a new on-chain programmable platform. And importantly, we want kind of this platform similar to how we want the infra infrastructure below it, want it to be permissionless. So that means that all of these account vendors that become compatible with ERC-7579 allow anyone to build modules and permissionlessly plug them into the account, um, rather than kind of most of the complexity and the burden being placed on the module developer. <clears throat> and this, we think, will lead to an app store moment for, uh, to an app store moment for smart accounts. So similar to how you have a phone or a laptop and you can just install apps and kind of like customize what you can do with that device and how it works. We think something similar will happen with smart accounts. So there's kind of like three areas in which we think this will happen. So for account vendors, kind of you can create plug and play wallet platforms for application developers. Then for dApps, um, dApps can actually deliver superior products. So one example there is that a game currently um, might require you to transfer funds into an escrow contract so that after a game is done, it can settle kind of like a bill. For example, you're betting on who is winning, and then the winner gets to collect the pot. But with smart accounts and an executor module, you could actually leave the funds in the account, so there's no initial kind of like transaction needed. And at the end of the game, you can just pull those funds out of the account. Or another example is kind of what I was kind of alluding to there, is just in general pull payments. Like it's super common in Web2, just sign up to something like Netflix, create a subscription, and then every month Netflix just pulls like $10 or whatever out of your account. That's also possible quite easily actually with executor modules. And then the final point there is wallet vendors. So you can see already a little bit with MetaMask Snaps, kind of the direction they're moving is kind of customizing the wallet and allowing developers to change how it works. Um, but on the MetaMask side, it's kind of very superficial. It's mostly about the UI. Whereas like on the smart account side, you can create a proper customizable wallet um, where users can actually change how it works. I can kind of wake up tomorrow and say, now I want this signature algorithm, or now I want kind of like these security measures. And then the wallet can facilitate this customization. <clears throat> and yeah, there are some kind of like module examples that we've been thinking about and kind of like putting out there. Um, some to highlight are, for example, P2P flash loans. So you can have kind of accounts that have flash loan modules installed and then you kind of you don't need an intermediary to facilitate the flash loan but you can kind of like pull it right out of like pull an asset right out of an account and then return it at the end of the transaction um, and yeah feel free to like read through the rest of them what another example is exploit protection um, so you could have a for example there's there's different implementations of this 
but you could have a cosigner that kind of monitors transactions, simulates them, monitors like domains that you're like a domain that you're currently on, um, or other common attacks, and then will only cosign your transaction kind of if it thinks that it's it's kind of like the, the the likelihood of being exploited is very low. Another example in the DeFi space is account management. So you could have a DeFi module or a set of modules that automatically rebalance your portfolio. You can have stop losses um, and you can have all kind of like funky stuff. For example, like copying like other people's DeFi strategies. So you could have a marketplace where people can kind of put those strategies and you can just opt in, which essentially automatically like copy trades. Um, yeah, and kind of like on a final point there on the modules, we actually think that plausibly modules could kind of be pivotal components for monetizing Web3 applications. So, so far, most apps just find it very hard and just haven't been able to monetize users. And obviously that's a problem if we want to get to a stage in Web3 where dApps should be long-term sustainable, where they need to make revenue to actually keep going. And kind of there are quite interesting ways to use modules to actually monetize these dApps, whether that be through subscriptions, like I was talking about earlier, or order flow monetization, such as through the portfolio management module I was talking about earlier, a dApp could take a fee off of every swap that it does or off of every kind of like portfolio rebalancing that it does. And actually that could be a way for these dApps, which right now we just think of kind of like these front end interfaces that we interact with to actually monetize and become sustainable in the long term. <clears throat> cool, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the, uh, of the presentation. So I was talking about the module kit earlier. Um, so you can get started with building with it. Um, it's 7.5.7.9 compatible, so it supports currently the reference implementation and also all the accounts that are compatible and kind of are going through audits right now. Um, so yeah, just scan the QR code if, if you want to. I think it takes you to the GitHub. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Sam.